Praise the Lord. I am Dr. Thomas Mantham IV, God's prophet to the nations and everybody's success strategist. I heard the Lord tell me to speak about two things here, and I've had a long day, a long week, long life. But uh, when I get revelation about something, it's, it's, it, it has to be spoken in the same hour, the same day. Because tomorrow uh, I, won't, I won't revisit it because I, I won't revisit it because I'm onto something else. So I'll speak on these two things. Number one, eliminating the control of need. And that's the main title. And I want to tell you this. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, whichever the verse it is, we can put it on the screen now. So you can see the scripture says, Cursed is the man that trusts in man. We don't like that so much, right? And blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Why, why would Jeremiah have to say it's like a cursed thing to just trust in men? Because men uh, oftentimes are evil. Sometimes they're stupid. Sometimes they're crafty. Sometimes they're unreliable. Sometimes they're full of issues. Sometimes they're full of demons. Sometimes they're just very unreliable. And it takes me right from Jeremiah 17, right to where Jesus said, when they called him good master, he said, don't call me good. I'm sure he said it with some emphasis. I'm sure. What do you think he said? Oh, don't call me good. He didn't say it like that. He, he probably pointed at them and said, hey, don't call me good. I haven't yet ascended. When I get up there, you know, we can talk about it later. I don't want to get into that because I'm on a message here, you know. How Jesus did it there, I'm sure he gave it some emphasis. And uh, why did he say that? Don't call me good. Because he, 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 the scripture says, because he was uh, amongst men and he knows what's in men. And the second portion of this message, uh, sub <clears throat> chapter and the other chapter, I'm combining two. One is eliminating the control of need. I'll continue in that. And the second one is knowing true divine connections. I'm going to tell you how and I'm going to help save somebody's time and life maybe. Because sometimes you think something's a divine connection because you see one side of somebody, but you don't know about the other side of them. And there's an old saying that says, you never know the, the strength, the flavor, or the bitterness of the tea until you dip it in hot water. <laughs> and the Lord said to me uh, some things about this, but he also directed me uh, and gave me a strategy on how to uh, poke the bear, so to speak. If a bear is calm, relaxed, and confident in a relaxed mode, you can poke him, you know, poke, poke, poke the bear. He probably won't react. He might just look at you and go, hmm. He may stay sleeping. If you get a bear when he's hibernating, you know, in the cave, they're, they're in a, like almost like a comatose state of unconsciousness for many months. I don't know how they do it. And their body lives on the, uh, the, the fat that's stored up over the time from the season before. And they don't have to move. They can just stay in a deep sleep called hibernation, to go through the winter. Can you imagine God made? Humans can't do that. You couldn't go to sleep for four months, three months, four months, five months. I don't, you know, however long it is, it's, it's a very long time. And just not move and just be out and, and still wake, shake yourself and wake up again one day. And you didn't have to drink nothing. You didn't have to eat anything. Can you imagine the creation of God? So a bear like that, if you're sleeping, you could poke him, he won't move. And if a bear, let's say a bear is like, let's say in the fantasy world, if a bear is calm and you poke him and he just won't react, he'll just kind of smile at you and go, huh. But what if the bear is angry <laughs> and you poke him? <laughs> he'll look calm and all of a sudden swing into motion. And they're so fast, you know, you got to watch. They have those big claws and big teeth. If a bear can look at you with their, with their cold eyes, you don't know what they're thinking. Same with a lion. Look, they could just be looking. And all of a sudden, in another second, they just jump and leap, and the person would be finished if they got a hold, if their teeth sunk into something. 
Even the claws of a lion when they're running, if they, they said if they slashed across a person, they could almost cut, cut a man in half. They could just slice with their, with their... Very dangerous. And you know, I found out some people are like that. And you really don't find out until you push the buttons. Let me give you some prophetic counsel. The day might come in a situation when you're waiting a long time and God may direct you to push the buttons to poke the bear. <laughs> you never heard anybody tell you this, but I'm gonna, I want to help people. Because I, 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 I've seen it, you know, and I don't want to tell personal stories. So, and I won't say what it's about, but one particular, one particular situation, and even the person themselves, if they ever watch this, they don't know that God spoke this to me. So they wouldn't even know, there's no reference point of who I'm talking about because I've not shared this with anyone. And even the person that God spoke to me this about. I asked the Lord about a particular person and he, he told me something about them. He told me two words. Can you believe it? Two words. He said, go slow. Oh. And then I think I wanted to go fast one day, you know, to accelerate uh, the business, whatever, we, something we were doing. And they reacted. The person reacted very badly. That threw the thing for a loop for a while. Then it came back around, and it seems like, okay, then there's all this more delay, more delay, more delay. But I asked the Lord, is this, is this right? Is this divine? And he never would tell me. Even his prophet, even his major prophet to the nations, the general in the kingdom, Mr. Thomas Manton IV. Oh, and the Lord didn't tell me. But guess what? I got tired of waiting. So I poked the bear. <laughs> and let me tell you, the bear reacted. <laughs> oh, Lord, I pray certain people never see this message. Uh, somebody may watch and go, they think it's about them. It's not about you. Forget it. It's not you. It's not you. It's not you. Trust me, it's not you. So you don't know. Uh, anyway. But I, but I found out that you, someone could have some great qualities and you think it's a divine connection. Yeah, and you're hoping for it. And you're like, wow, this looks good. This looks great, you know? This seems right, and all of a sudden, whew, something, when you provoke the thing, when you push the buttons, the reaction that comes, completely insane. You know, it, it, I likened it to this. It's like, I heard this word, like I, I, you know, I have a very creative imagination, so I don't always have to say, God said. I don't do that. I could say God showed me or I saw by revelation or I saw it in my imagination or I saw it in a vision or I saw it in the spirit. The voice of God speaking is one thing. And you know, I'm a master and expert at that. I've been doing this a long time. I've been walking with God a long time. When the voice of the Lord speaks, I will tell you he said it. And when he speaks, I will tell you he said it. You know, clearly like that. The voice of the Lord spoke. He spoke audibly in the spirit, but sometimes I even hear it so loud, it's almost like it came, it's almost like it came from outside of me, the voice of the Lord. But other times you just see something and know it, you know? And uh, I, I begin to understand that, uh, and I had the, uh, something in a, in a deeper dimension and it's really not good. And I, and I had this thought, and, I, and I, this is what I said. The dream that seemed so nice has turned into a nightmare. <laughs> and here's the solution, my friend, for this. Wake up. Wake up. <laughs> Wake up and come out of the sleep and move on and find another day. The quicker you do that, the better. I was teaching this morning. Um, you'll see the video, it's coming out, and uh, it'll be coming out soon. At 7 a.m. this morning, a few minutes after 7, I was in the pulpit and I was speaking. And the teaching title, I, I'll give it a title, it was really rich. I was, 
I was talking about as the deer, from Psalm 42 I started out, as the deer longs and pants for the water, so, you know, thirsts for the water and desires to drink, so my soul longs after you. I want to drink of your living water, Lord. And I said, this, this causes an attraction to God. He sees your seriousness and your passion and he wants to come and fill the void. You know, the scripture also says, let's put it on the screen, the one who thirsts, uh, hungers and thirsts after righteousness will be filled. Yes or yes? Yes, it will happen. And then I begin to go on to say that um, your desire to move fast, and I talked about, I spoke about, I talked about timing at the end of the message. It's a powerful message. Uh, a re a revelations from, of, of what Isaiah 60 verse 22 means. The Lord said, I will hasten things in its time. I will hasten it in its time. People talk about timing and say, well, God has this timing or that timing. No, he was already ready. I have news for you. God was already ready. God can never, ever, ever be accused of being late, being lazy, being unknowing, being uncaring, being unkind to his own righteous. He could be unkind to the devil and his ugly friend. To an evildoer, to a rebel, oh, he can be very unkind. But to me, he's going to be kind. He's not going to show himself unkind to me because I'm kind to him and I'm all about his business. I'm all about his work. Man, I found this scripture in the Amplified Classic today. I think it's Acts 20, 28, something like that. It says, no, let me read it to you. Let me get it. Let me get it. Oh, it's so good. None of these things move me, Paul said, because I'm just about the Father's business. Let me, let me read it. Let me read it. I got I to get it. Ooh. Help me to hurry up because I'm, I'm a hurry up kind of guy. Here it is. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Acts, I was close. Acts 20, 20, Acts 20, Acts 20, verse 24. Amplified classic, AMPC. Paul said, but none of these things move me, neither do I esteem my life dear even to myself. If only I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have obtained from which was entrusted to me by the Lord Jesus Christ and to faithfully attest to the good news of the gospel of God's grace, his unmerited favor, spiritual blessing, and mercy. The key thing there is I don't have cares about what goes on in this over and above even my own uh, convenience. But I must finish my course. That is the joy of my life. He said, I must finish my course with joy and the ministry that I've obtained from the Lord Jesus. I like it. It popped up in one of the apps as verse of the day. I thought, that's a good verse for today. It's something I'm deal I was dealing with, and uh, I thought, that's very appropriate, Lord. I don't, none of these things move me because I'm about the Father's business. So, um, the hot water that will extract the inner self will, will turn out and prove like what is good, acceptable, and perfect, or not. <laughs> I, love, I like Romans 12, 1, 2, and 3. The good and perfect and acceptable will of the Lord. What does it mean? God has three different wills? Uh, not really. I think he has one. And then you, you prove it by your intensity, how much you want to get into it. That which is good, acceptable, maybe, just acceptable. Which is like, uh, come see, come saw, not so great. And then good, that's better, and perfect. We prove the will of God. If you're kind of nonchalant about it, it's like acceptable only. If you want to get into the realm of good, that's better. But perfect, ah. So many things, so there's three wills of God. The thing that's acceptable, the thing that's good, and the thing that's perfect. Where'd you get that from? How do you figure that? What scripture is that? How is that revelation of Romans 12, verse 3? For that, he said, uh, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And something else I got a hold of is that is this. 
Spiritual maturity makes you into something you weren't before, and also you never, ever, ever uh, can let things move you. They shouldn't bother you. And the less they bother you, the more mature you're becoming. Yeah. And when you see things you don't like, I tell you, today, I saw about 10 things I didn't like. I didn't care for at all. Didn't like it at all. So what? Do I care? No. None of these things move me because I'm about the Father's business. And then you get shocked by this, disappointed by that, and, it, and, and, I'm, and I'm checking myself and it doesn't bother me. It's amazing. I can't say I'd always feel like that, you know? I can't say I've always felt like that, no. Things would, would, could disturb you deeply, and all of a sudden they don't. You know what? That's time for promotion. That's time you could be trusted with more. All these people running around thinking they're going to be great, powerful, big, huge, rich, successful, famous, fame and fortune and all that. If you can't handle it, it can destroy you. God doesn't do things quick. He builds line upon line, precept upon precept, glory, from faith to faith, from glory. Starts with faith. You believe God for better things. Faith to faith and glory to glory. You, you don't just wake up one morning and, and you're so great. You know, and I gave this analogy in the morning message. I said, uh, I said, uh, some, you, you might get some kid that's like a, uh, becomes like a superstar in the entertainment world or whatever when he's young and gets millions of dollars. And then by the time he's 30, maybe he's 20 years old, by the time he's 30, he's dead from a drug overdose somewhere. You know how many people have died young? They had the thing called the, 20, the 27 factor. All these famous rock stars died at 27. Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Janis Joplin. Uh, uh, the other one was Amy Winehouse in London. She drank herself to death. She drank herself to death. She was a total psycho, by the way, and, uh, but gifted musically, got famous, got a lot of money. I saw one time in a video, I couldn't believe it, she took a flying leap kick at a guy. She ran across this field and jumped into the air. She, she had to be on drugs. She had to be on something. And she leaped in the air and she went flying across sideways like you'd see in a movie. Like airborne, sideways, feet out, straight. And hit this guy right in the chest. And I'm sure she probably broke his ribs and knocked him down the side of the mountain, not to fall off and die. He just rolled, rolled, rolled. The guy was definitely wounded. I'm sure he had some broken bones. And she just got up, walked, looked like at him, and huh, and she just walked away. I thought, this lady's on, she, she was hyped up on something. Next thing you know, 27 years old, found dead in London. And uh, I used to know the name of that, uh, not Fulham, so there's a place up in North London. There's a big drug, it's a big drug uh, principality. Drugs and uh, pubs and, I mean, uh, clubs and a lot, of, a lot of illicit activity there. It's in the north side of, man, I know where it is, you know, because I passed through there, but I can't remember the name. But anyway, she, she was staying there, there, and she was found, she didn't wake up the next day. She drank the whole night from the night till the morning and she was gone. 27. Talented. She even made a song with Tony Bennett, the famous singer, and did a, a duo album with him. But she's gone now. Where'd she end up? You die in your sleep drunk, in a drunken rage, uh, and you're doing all these crazy things. Guess what? Is it automatically a ticket to heaven when your heart stops beating? I would say probably not. How sad is that? Jimi Hendrix died in his sleep, drug overdose. Janis Joplin died of a heroin overdose. These were famous rock stars. Millions of dollars hit the top when they were in their late teens, 20 years old. Within seven years, they were dead. Is that good? No, it's not good. And another guy from Led Zeppelin, the drummer, John Bonham, he drank himself to death. He drank like 40 ounces of vodka in one shot. 40 ounces. You know how much that is? 32, I think, is one, one big bottle like that. Big bottle like that? 
and one and a half or two. I mean, that is absolutely lethal. It's like you're poisoning yourself. There's no way you can survive. He's dead. Where'd he end up? Hmm. So, uh, a, a pretty graphic example there of what happens to people. Keith Moon was another one. He died of a drug overdose. The, the, the drummer for The Who. These were very talented guys, but they became maniacs because their, their character was off. They didn't have the self-control button was broken. <laughs> it didn't work. So, you see, so let's say in the kingdom, the father wants to give us great things. Does he do it the first day we think about it? He can't. Why can't he? He can if he wanted to, but he won't because he loves us. So you grow from faith to faith, from glory to glory. You prove yourself in different dimensions, and then God begins to take care of you. And I just saw the angel of the Lord. Hi, hello, you're here. Wow, every time I'm on, the angels come. Wow, this is great. Lord, let the angels of God touch us, touch everybody. Whatever they're carrying from heaven, we receive the glory, the power, the miracle of anointing, breakthrough, favor, promotion, connections, and all of that we receive. So, God builds you step by step. And then you also get to the point where you don't need something. Somebody gave me something today, and it was such an insult uh, to, as people would say, you surmise it like that, and I won't touch it, and I don't need it, and I don't want it. And here's what I wanted to say. I will not mix my seed with someone's greed. If they want to play games and do such a despicable thing, when they were supposed to pay a lot of money and they paid like nil, almost nothing, and it doesn't even meet the expenses of what was spent to actually do the thing, uh, that, that's, that's, uh, and they know they're doing it. They know exactly what they're doing. It. I will not touch that man's stuff. I don't want anything else from them in my lifetime. In fact, I, I think I've, I'll disengage forever and never revisit that again. So, and, and you know what? I, I, I'm going to tell a, a great leader the story and, uh, and say this too, that you know, people, people better be careful because God can react. And people keep playing these games with servants of God, you know, pastors or whatever they call themselves. And uh, they, they just want to... But you know what? None of these things move me. In fact, the, scriptures, the scripture is so brilliant. And the principle is eliminating the control of need. You don't need man to help you like the man at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. He said, I had no man to help me. Guess what? He didn't need man to help him. He couldn't make it to the, the angel troubled the water. He didn't make it in fast enough. He thought he needed a man. It probably would have been good if somebody helped him, picked him up and got him close to the water. And when the angel of the Lord, this is supernatural. Can you imagine? Came and what they call troubled the water. Maybe the water began to move. Maybe it began to bubble. Who knows what? Like it was a wave going on in the pool of Bethesda. I was there in Jerusalem. I saw it. The five porches of Solomon. And in, in the middle, there's this like uh, carved out place that's like was a pool of water. Which is, which is the literal pool of Bethesda. I was there. I looked at it and I thought, wow, I'm in Bible reality right here. And I got my Bible and I, I just went through the book of John 5 to read the story again while I was there and looked again and said, this is the actual place where Jesus, oh my God, Jesus walked his, with his own feet right here, right here where I'm standing. And we went to the Garden of Gethsemane, the olive trees where he was. They actually said, they, they thought that historically they figured out which tree he was near. Now, to, to be confirmed later, I mean, but I, I got right close to that spot. And I was amazed that I'm actually standing here where the Lord himself stood. What, what, a, what an amazing thing. I mean, I, I believe every, every believer needs to go to Israel. And I'm going to put uh, some tours on where people can come to Israel with me. And it's been prophesied. Guess what? I can think about it and desire it, and I can still do it by faith and arrange it like that. But when the Lord speaks a prophetic word to a major apostle about us doing that, it's a done deal. 
And that has happened. A uh, major prophetic word came from a major apostolic prophetic leader and uh, said exactly that, that I would take people to Israel. I, so, so we're going to plan it when we can. We'll let everybody know. Not this year. Forget it. I'm cooked and booked this year. I can't do it. I, I'm too busy. Uh, who knows when? A bit later. But we'll get to it. So, and uh, let the Gaza mess calm down a little bit. No, though that wouldn't deter me. If God said go now, I'd go anywhere. In fact, I had a vision of myself going to Baghdad, standing on the, uh, on the soil there in the city and prophesying over the city. And I thought, am I going to be like one of the two witnesses? <laughs> Is the dragon going to kind of try to kind of come and get us? Because you know? there's another prophet in America that we were going, we were going to go, and he, he got cancer and died. It's really sad. And you know who he was? His name was Dennis Tinarino. T-I-N-E-R-I-N-O, Dennis Tinarino. If you look him up, you'll be amazed at who he actually is. He was the five or six time, six times, maybe, maybe even seven times. I think Arnold Schwarzenegger was the one that beat him. He was Mr. Olympia, Mr. Universe. I think it was Mr. Olympia, Mr. Universe. The bodybuilding champion. You know, the guys that are ripped muscle guys. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger won that title eight times. It became the historic world record breaker. And then he went into the Hollywood movie industry and made hundreds of millions of dollars. And the rest is history. You know, Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger, I listen to him now. He's in California. He seems to have become one of these woke liberals, which is really sad because the guy is macho and as strong as him. Should be a conservative, tough guy, but he, you know, they, they get mixed up in their political ways. Of, I don't know what this thing about called going woke or whatever it is. They become soft in the head. Another actor who's a total psycho is a guy from, I, well, now that I'm calling people names, I probably shouldn't say their name. Let me refrain from saying these guys, this guy's name. He, he played the bad guy, the tough guy in a lot of mafia movies. You might know. And he hates Donald Trump, and he begins to speak out, curse, curse at Donald Trump. Even in the, he goes to the Academy Awards, and he stands up, and he goes, blank, blank, Donald Trump. You know, he's a, he's a complete psycho. He's a complete idiot. His career has dried up. People have lost respect for him. He's lost the plot. I thought this was the tough guy. He should be the guy that's on the side of, you know, right-wing things, not left-wing things. He's, he should be the kind of guy that loves Donald Trump. Not hate, he's not a Trump hater, you know. I don't understand these people. I, I think it's some kind of demon somewhere in there. But Dennis Tinarino, the bodybuilding champion, look him up, you see his pictures, you'd be amazed. That guy was fantastic. He got saved and he became a prophet, a real prophet, because I, someone gave me his number. And I called him, and he answered the phone on the first ring, and he had a kind of a New York accent. He was from Brooklyn. He goes, hey, and what's your name again? Thomas. He goes, he called him Tom. Hey, Tom, how's it going? How's it going, Tom? Then he begins to, he begins to hear, go, I hear the Lord saying, he began, I, didn't, I couldn't, back in those days, you know, I, I didn't have the recorder thing, so I wish I had a, and it was on a, some kind of handheld uh, phone, not the cell phone, you know? So I, a landline that I called him on. Oh, God, I wish I had to be able to hit the speaker. Uh, maybe it had a speaker, I don't know. But I, to record what he said, he prophesied for 20 minutes straight and said the most amazing things over me. And but we, we, we ended up talking about how we would plan to go to Iraq. He says, he says, Tom, I have connections with the U.S. military. If you want to go, let's arrange it. We can go. They'll protect us. They'll, we'll fly in on the military aircraft and be there. I said, man, I, had, I told him I had a vision of this. I saw myself like the two witnesses standing in an evil place and prophesying against evil forces. You know, like the two witnesses from the Bible. Who knows if it's going to be Elijah and Moses? Who's going to be? The scripture doesn't name the names, but uh, <laughs> what a story. And next thing you know, some time went by. I was very busy. I got busy, busy, busy. I'm traveling around the world. And I didn't really follow up on it so quick. Very sad. 
And next thing you know, I heard he's sick, and I'm like, oh my God. And I tried to get him back again, and I couldn't, I couldn't reach him. And next thing you know, he's dead at 61, 60 years old. Gone. I was like, oh my God. That's so sad. Another one was a guy, an apostle named Turnell Nelson, who was the spiritual father of uh, Miles Monroe. And he used to preach for him all the time in Nassau, Bahamas. And I was in the conference with Miles Monroe in Nassau at his church. And uh, Turnell Nelson was there. And he walked in the vestib- into the entrance, uh, uh, glass doors, whatever, into, into the lobby. And he saw me. And he stopped and his face lit up. And he went, prophet of God. Everybody got scared and stopped, the whole place. There were people everywhere. They just looked at me. He, he didn't care. He started prophesying over me. You are a prophet unto the Lord. Powerful. Oh, he started saying all these things. And he's from Trinidad, you know, so he had the Yaman accent a bit. He raised his voice really loud. Anyway, he gave me his cell phone number. Either he gave it to me then or somebody that was with us gave it to me. I, some weeks later, months later, I called him. He was in Toronto, Canada, and he answered the phone. I was able to get him. Maybe it was his hotel. I think it, it could have been in his hotel or something. I can't remember. It was, it was a while back. And he answered the phone, and he said, Man of God, I remember you. He goes, Come to Trinidad and minister to us. He had that kind of voice. Come to Trinidad and minister to us, Hoss. I said, I'd be privileged to. Oh, how can we do And again, I was so busy, I didn't jump on it. And uh, he was preaching a message that we're supposed to live to 120 years old. I think it's not so good to preach on that, maybe, because funny enough, he was supposed to, we have to live to 120, and he's in his mid-70s now, and he dies. <laughs> and now Miles Monroe, beloved, bless his memory, he's gone. Plane crash, yes. And I was with Miles Monroe on his last trip to, uh, out of the Bahamas, was, it was in Nairobi, Kenya. And I have a picture of him, him and me with our arm around each other. And uh, the last words of Miles Monroe to me, he also called me Tom. It wouldn't use Thomas. That's okay. He goes, Tom, uh, I'm going to send you a personal email to let you know when and where we can get together next and have some personal time together. I was like, thank you very much. What an honor. Uh, let's do that. And then three weeks later, after he left uh, Africa back to the Bahamas, plane crash, gone. I thought, oh boy. So what's the point? Maybe we need to strike when the iron's hot. You know, there's a theme in this, what I'm saying here. Uh, divine, now those are definite divine connections because those were really great men. Dennis Titorino, Turnell, T-U-R-N-E-L, Nelson, N-E-L-S-O-N. You can look him up. And Miles Monroe, M-Y-L-E-S-M-U-N-R-O-E, Miles the Great, Miles Monroe. He was a very, fam- very famous preacher, more than Turnell Nelson. But. And Turnell Nelson had like 300 plus churches or more just in the Caribbean islands alone. If I went to him, I would have had ac- open access to all the other network of churches. But since he died and I never got to do it with him, I don't know those other guys. And I'm sure they wouldn't be, maybe they wouldn't even be hospitable to have, a, to have somebody come. You know, I'll tell you something else, a powerful key. Great men are very hospitable. They're very secure, and they're able to work with people. Ones that are insecure, religious, stuffy, they, they guard everything, they're, they're blockers, you know? Those kind of guys, they look at you like, oh, who are you? And Anybody that has that attitude is a punk. And usually they're never the famous one. They could be the juniors of the big guy, but they're never the big guy. The big guy is always a gracious lover, a friend of people. Miles Monroe is like that, very friendly. Um, Dennis Titorino. Uh, I told him who my father was. I'm from New York City. But, but he goes, okay, that's good. But the Lord started to talk to him, and he took 20 minutes plus with me on the phone. And we had never met. We were just, he, he, he honored the, the connection that gave me his number 
was a person that he respects. That was the key. So knowing true divine connections, that's one way. You see opportunities come. And then other people, sometimes you think it's a divine connection. And then you got to test the waters and see what's in the water. Hello? I'm lifting my hands to the Lord and taking a little break here to pray for a half a second. And we could do the same. Let's all pray together. If you do or you don't, it's okay, but I'm doing it myself right now. To know divine connections. You got to know what's in people. Jesus said, don't call me good because I haven't yet ascended. I'm amongst you all. And I know what's... He, the scripture says he said that because he knows what's in men. Think about that. And then the scripture... Wow, this is good. I'm just getting this right now from the Holy Ghost. I didn't think of this before because I have it memorized in my, in my mind and spirit. You know the scripture that says uh, the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Imagine that. This was Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a lot to say. I, I have something else in scripture. My eyes fell upon this in Jeremiah 14. Let me read it. Uh, o Lord, verse 7. Jeremiah 14, 7. I just happen to have this open in my Bible here by the Spirit of the Lord. O oh Lord, the iniquities testify against individuals. Even he was saying it as a prayer, as a prophet and an intercessor. Our iniquities testify against us. Meaning he's standing in the way of the Israelites, the rebellious house, the stiff-necked people that with the, hard, with the hard faces, he said, don't look at, remember God said when he, when he called Jeremiah, he said, don't look at their faces because they're, <laughs> they're wicked, they're stone cold, they're killers, they're, they're, they're haters. Don't look at their faces, just prophesy. Just go with my voice, don't look at their reaction. Sometimes you're even preaching to people, they may be listening, but they don't respond very well. The preacher, what he needs to do is just go internalize a bit, uh, hit, hit, hit the reset button if you've just begun the service or, or this, your speech or your sermon, whatever you want to call it, or your, your preaching time or your message. Just stop and go, uh, I'm going to tune out the audience and just they're there, but I'm going to speak out in the spirit and preach from your spirit and let it fly and see what happens. Sometimes you get a lot of amen, sometimes you don't. It doesn't mean that people are bad. I had somebody, I was amazed. Two people came up, a, a few people came, at least two that I can remember. There might have been more wanted to talk to me, but uh, we, were rush, we were always rushed in and out, which I don't really like. I like to spend time with the people. Anyway, whatever. And uh, I, I, I was up when it was, I left the house when it was still dark in the morning. It was so early, and I had hardly slept, so I was kind of just making it through the morning, you know. So... And, uh, but people came up to me and said, I was blessed by the message. And somebody said, I really want your book. And somebody said, yeah, they, they were listening. And even the babies outside, I took a bunch of pictures of the babies. I put two on the Facebook already. Uh, and I was going to put more, but I took a whole bunch more after that. Pictures of all these babies, so beautiful, so cute. Do you know what they were doing? They were running up to me, smiling, wanting to give me a high five. And they said, hi, Pastor Thomas. And they, they knew my name. I'm like, hi, you must have been really listening. Or somebody told you, asked somebody, what's his name? Not just Mzungu. Hey, Mzungu. I'm like, uh, my name is Thomas. Hi, Pastor Thomas. These little kids. And they were everywhere. Let me tell you, God's looking for the young generation to teach them and raise them up. It's really going to happen. It's really going to happen. So the opportunity of a divine connection, you need to seize it. You see how the Holy Ghost has me on this. And then somebody, bless their darling hearts for whatever reason, we hope they get through it, that people that have issues or problems, you need to be very careful. You need to be very careful about deeper connections with people that have very deep-rooted problems. It's bad. And I want to prophesy. I do this every, almost every meeting. I prophesy over people. I'll do it again today on this broadcast. 
people that uh, you don't need to be in covenant with, God will help you find a way to see it exposed that it's not right. Now, we still love the person. God still loves the person. There's, I always say there's hope, but it might take time, and we certainly don't have the time. In fact, it may be irreparable, unrepairable, that you can never connect in a way. You have to accept that. You know the old saying, never breathe life into something God is killing. Don't try to resurrect something the Lord has said, I'm switching it off. Don't try to bring it, don't breathe life into it. Let it go. I thought God speak to me about certain people. I said, no, not them. And I thought, and they seemed so nice. They had, let me tell you, everybody can have, it's very deceptive, can have a very good part of a quality about themselves. And it's very pleasant. It's very admirable, very attractive. It's very uh, enticing even. You know, you feel this person really is, has, a, has a, a tremendous gift and style and personality, but there's something else in the teapot that won't come up to the surface unless you put the boiling water or else you poke, poke, poke and push the buttons. And then when you get the reaction that you don't want, just take it as reality. You know, there's also another saying, when someone shows you who they are, believe them because that's reality. Sometimes we, we overlook things. And, some, and sometimes the, per, I want to say this too. Yeah, Lord. Sometimes the people, that, the person that wants to accuse you of being wrong about something, they're the one that has the problem. Not to say that we're perfect and nobody, nobody has a problem of their own, but what they're, what they're railing at you about, you didn't do anything wrong. You might have just pushed the button and got the reaction, then they want to come at you. It's shocking, but it's okay. Guess what? It's okay. Everybody lift your hand and say, it's okay. God showed me. He did me a favor. He really helped me. I didn't have to waste any more time to prolong the inevitable that it wasn't going to work. This is a very profound message. You can say thank you by sending a nice big offering. Because some preachers uh, that do events, they don't. They just want to find any way to rip you off, give you nothing. It happens again. It happened again. Uh, well, a few moments ago. It just happens over and over and over. It seems to be the system. So guess what? Who has the last laugh? The one who's got the power of God. And that's me. And we're going to raise the work now and uh, stop dancing around with uh, people expecting anything. But you know what? I have peace because God is the provider. Now, here's the thing. You have to weigh out the situation. And I thought, I thought a lot about this, and I made the decision. I'm going to keep going places because the experience of blessing people, and also we're always filming, and uh, all the meetings I do everywhere, you get, people get to see the video. And God really moves in these meetings. He really speaks. So you just got to chalk it up as this is like a loss in this way because they don't want to do anything. I won't hate them for it, but God could have an issue with it and he'll deal with them, but that's okay. Myself, I'm all right. You, when you look at your own heart and you feel peace about a situation that seems unpleasant and it doesn't really bother you or disturb you and you don't react or have a problem, guess what? You're passing the test. <laughs> You're, 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 you're growing in maturity. You're getting ready for the promotion. And God is big on promoting people that can handle things and handle pressure or handle situations. And they don't bother you. He can give you more to do. Not that he wants to give you more problems. You ever hear these idiots speaking stupid things like, uh, oh Lord, give, give. I'm not going to say me. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to use the word me because that, that applies to myself. And I don't want it. I'm not accepting. I'm not confessing. But they say, give them more problems, but they use themselves as the, you know what I mean? But I can't, I'm not going to say that in my mouth. Lord, give them themselves more problems. 
you must be a complete idiot and a psycho. I'll just tell you straight up. Anybody that ever says that, you're a religious, you're a religious moron. You're just a moron. M-O-R-O-N. More on. More off than on, but why do they call it? They should have called it a more off. <laughs> you're just off. I had this guy in London, yeah? I'm sorry I have no respect for him, even though he has a church. He had stacks of his books unsold in his office, stacked to the ceiling. I thought, man, you should put those in a closet. People shouldn't come sit in your office and say, what's these boxes to the ceiling? Oh, that's my printing of books. Why, why are they packed in boxes in the middle of your office? Find the closet, man. You have a building. Build the closet. Punch a hole in the wall and put a door and stuff them in there. Don't show us your unsold books. And this guy chased me around the city of London, chased me everywhere, was asking for my phone number. He couldn't get me. And finally, somebody got, he, gave, he got my number called. And he's desperately saying, I need a prophetic word. I need you to pray for me. I need. And uh, I thought, great. Uh, I feel your, 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 your excitement. I feel your excitement. So I thought, let me, pray, let me pray for you. So I went to his office and he's like, oh, you have to come speak. In the, so I prophesied over him. I prayed over him. He was, he was just, I wanted to talk for a while. And he was sitting there fidgety with, with his, doing this with his fingers. He's like, can we get to the prayer time? Can we get to pray? I was like, just wait a minute. And you, you see he was really. So I was really teasing him and messing him up by telling him to wait more. So then... Uh, I prayed, whatever I prophesied, it was some good things, you know. He said, you have to come to the church. So another amazing thing happened. A very famous preacher from China, the, the leader of the Chinese underground church, Brother Yun is his name, Y-U-N. You can look him up, Brother Yun, Y-U-N. His name is Brother Yun, and his book that he wrote is called The Heavenly Man. And in it, he tells the stories of how he was tortured in a Chinese prison. In fact, one time uh, when they came, when they raided, they showed up at where they were. He jumped out the window thinking he would escape, which would have been great because, you know, those guys were coming to kill and imprison pastors or kill them. These demon-possessed red communist Chinese regime government operatives dressed in their little silly uniforms or whatever with their machine guns, they weren't playing. They took people to jail and they tortured them mercilessly. The things they did, I can't even speak. It's almost like the Fox's Book of Martyrs, which is a horrible thing to read. F-O-X-E apostrophe S, Book of Martyrs, M-A-R-T-Y-R-S. I would say uh, parental discretion advised Viewer discretion advised, uh, it's got violence in it and very bad things. So if you don't want to lose sleep and have a few nightmares, I would kind of suggest you don't read it. But there are people that are sick in the head, you know, they think, oh, how did the apostles die? I thought, I don't want to read that because I'm not planning to do that. You know, John was boiled in oil and the oil couldn't heat him up because he had the protection of God put around his skin, just like the the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they couldn't burn in the, in the fire that was made seven times hotter. The, the, the king's, uh, uh, was it Nebuchadnezzar was the guy who was, was he the one? When, when they, he said, make it seven times hotter for these guys because they say they're, you know, servants of Jehovah God. And the ones that got near the fire burnt up and died, his workers, but... It was seven times hotter that even once, even guys that didn't go inside the fire or too close to it, they burnt up and died because it was that hot. And they threw them in there and they didn't burn. So John had that supernatural experience. But others didn't. They were, <laughs> it was bad what happened to them, what was done to them. And the Fox's Book of Martyrs talks about that. So Brother Yoon's book, he tells all the stories of how they tortured him, what they did. And I won't go into detail. If you ever dare to read the book at your own peril, help yourself. If you enjoy it, I think you're a bit uh, uh, deranged. Uh, I wouldn't enjoy it, that kind of thing. But he's a very nice guy. So when I'm there, I preached in the morning. 
and I said some very strong uh, success principles. And the religious spirit in this guy reacted to that. Another story I won't go into now. So thus, he was poked, you know. At first, the prophet of God is in London, myself. Come prophesy to me. It all seems good, right? When I get in the pulpit and I'm teaching some stuff, he wants to fight about over some of the things I said, which were absolutely brilliant principles, but his religious demon or whatever he has, it, it didn't rub him right, and he began to, you know, try to, try to come against those things. And I had, I had it happen to a guy in New Jersey, too. We lost uh, friendship over some things I said in the message, which were brilliant about prosperity. He, he, the guy tells me, well, you shouldn't teach those things because people might want to expect too much. And you use the word opulent. I said, what's wrong with that? Opal is a precious stone. Opal, opulent, means elegant, means superb, uh, uh, distinguished, fantastic, sophisticated. It's a wonderful word. And they, these guys in the church, you think you shouldn't say that. Yet he had a fancy car outside himself from his business. Because from the church, he didn't make no money because he doesn't preach about anything good about finances. So I'm sure in his church, they're all poor. Uh, people are poor there and not doing very well. And there was one lady who's a multimillionaire. She gave me, she wrote me a big check when I came. I was like, boy, I'd like to be friends with her. Uh, she took us to lunch and gave me a big check uh, as a blessing. But they're millionaires, you see. So maybe they're footing the bill for everything for him. But to preach about it, to teach the body of Christ on like how to break through, some of these guys, they, another angel right there. Wow. They react. Do I care? None of these things move me. Acts 20, 24, Amplified Classic. I just care about the calling, fulfilling the ministry and the mission that God's given, given me to do. Yeah. And it's, that, that's my joy. It's God's joy, too, that I'm happy about doing that in joy. God has joy over me having joy about it. Fulfilling the ministry and the purpose that he has ordained for me. So, um, so in the night, I did the Sunday morning. And it was a big crowd. Pretty good for London, England. Hundreds of people. I don't know how many hundreds. I can't remember. Exactly. And the night, sir, I think the church sat four or five hundred. It would be packed out at about, about five hundred. And uh, the building there, the seating capacity in the, in the room of the, church, the, the hall, the church, the church sanctuary. And uh, the evening service, Brother Yoon came. People came from everywhere. People were outside. The church was full even before the service started. Every seat was full to capacity. They put extra chairs People were outside trying to listen. I felt, I felt so, so much compassion for them. I wish I could have went out and found them all a seat somewhere. But. So Brother Yoon is speaking. I'm telling his old testimony. But before that, the Lord had me get up and prophesy. They, they asked me to come up and you know, introduce uh, the meeting, whatever, and speak for a few minutes before Brother Yoon came on. This is the famous guy, the head of the underground church of China. And his stats at the time was that they led 58 million people to Jesus in China. You think there's no revival in the midst of these communist uh, psycho regimes? Yeah, there is. In Iran, they say one of the biggest revivals in the world is running underground in Iran, even as we speak. Oh yes, there are real Christians there, people getting saved. In China, and this is what I prophesied. Hundreds of millions will get saved. God's going to break things loose on the United Kingdom and Europe and all these things. I was under such a heavy anointing. And uh, the people began to shout. The people of London, these Brits, most of them in that meeting were white Brits. There were some black, brown mix, mixes in there, different uh, ethnicities. But for the most part, it was like probably 70% white people, 60, 70% at least. And they shouted like they lost their minds. The Holy Ghost fell and hit the place, the glory fell. So the pastor comes up after me, and this is what he says. He takes the mic, he kills the whole anointing. I thought, he should keep this thing going. Because I know I couldn't take long, because Brother Yoon is there. 
And he has his interpreter, a Swedish man. I think that man's gone to be with the Lord. Uh, last I heard, he said, I think his name was Malcolm or something like that. He's from Sweden, and he spoke perfect Mandarin. So he was Brother Yoon's interpreter, because Brother Yoon didn't speak a lick of English, not a word. He could probably say hello, goodbye, hi, that's it. Not another word. 100% pure Mandarin, and this guy would interpret for him everything he's, he's saying. So, of course, everybody's waiting for him. So I, I didn't have so, so much time. So the pastor gets up and takes the mic. Now, this is the way to know, by the Spirit of the Lord, a non-divine connection. And I'll tell you something else he did afterwards. I'm just telling it all in this message. I want to expose all of this because you, you, you got to know who's good and who's not. You have to also know the difference between good and best. The good person can be good. Okay, they're all right. Good, acceptable, perfect. Remember that? Romans 12, 3. But they're just good or okay. A lot of people are like that. But then there's the perfect person that's the right person. That's a higher level. When you have the right person in your life, oh my God. That's when you begin to get things done. Say amen. So, so the, the power of God hit the place. People were shouting. Some people began to stand up. They were leaping up and down on their feet. Oh, I wish I had that video somewhere. I, I used to have the audio recording. I, we may have it somewhere in the archives. What a powerful prophecy. You could feel the fire and authority of God coming through the audio, even the audio, as I was speaking. I don't know if they videoed. I, I, unfortunately, I don't know if they videoed that meeting. And I didn't arrange to. I wish I did. But of course, I'm a guest speaker in the church, and it happened quick, so like this Sunday, and I didn't bring, I didn't, wasn't walking around with cameras that week, so I wish I was. Better luck next time, but um, he takes the mic and he goes, uh, it, you know, it's wonderful to be exuberant. This is, I mean, it's what a disgusting word. It's wonderful to be exuberant in his presence. I was like, oh no, this guy's going to kill it. But we need to embrace the message. He, he, I, I said, speak for yourself, pal. I'm sitting there and I said it like, say it for yourself. Don't speak that over the people. I said it. People looked at me like, what did I just say? I, I rebuked the guy <laughs> audibly sitting there, the pastor. Oh yeah, I didn't get up and say, hey you. I talked to him, but I, I was sitting there and I just spoke out, you know, because I want to kill it in the, in the realm of the spirit as much as I can. It's wonderful to be exuberant in his presence, but he, he, let's say, how do I say it for he himself, but him needs to embrace the message of suffering like Brother Yoon is going to teach us because he's saying, I read his book, The Heavenly Man. I thought, you blithering idiot. You know what we should do for you? You like suffering so much? Let's buy you a plane ticket. Hello? Let's get you a plane ticket and fly you right to the Chinese communists, whatever, and, and stuff a bunch of illegal Bibles in your suitcase. Yeah, and you didn't know it. Then when they find them, they'll arrest you and throw you into the prison. And let them do to you what they did to torture beloved brother Yoon, the Chinese apostle. He's from there, okay? He's a righteous man. And he was able to take it. And he even said things like, you know, like he didn't care. Like if they kill him or whatever, he didn't care. Imagine, he got to that level. So he was able to like, by willpower and sheer force of the Holy Ghost, whatever, overcome that kind of suffering and torture and all that. Things they did to him, I can't even, if they're, they're in his book, I can't, I don't even want to, I know some of them I don't want to repeat. It's really bad. I mean, bad, bad, bad. One time he, he said he fasted for like 72 days because he just couldn't take it. He said, I, I'm going to fast until I get out of here or, or God, you take me home. It was that, it was that, he was that serious. And I'll tell you the story of what happened next. So when, so I thought, 
If you like this suffering so much, pal, you're living in free London, all right? You have a church over here, and you, you, you eat good food, and you got your wife and your whatever you got. Enjoy life as much as you can. But you got this religious fixation on this. You should experience it, right? Like people that preach against prosperity, like they talk about, they rail at people that teach people how to be delivered financially and blessed financially. Well, guess what? You should be broke then. All the money you have, all the houses you have, give them away and go live in a cardboard shack somewhere. If you hate provision and hate material things and you think none of it, you think it's wrong or it's some other gospel or an aberration of, of people mis, uh, interpreting or using the scripture, then you go live that life. And some of these guys that come against people, they have million dollar houses. This one in California, a famous guy known, known for slant, slamming men of God that are powerful and anointed. He has like three multi-million dollar mansions that he lives in. Not one, not two, three different houses. And he's driving like a, a top luxury car, many cars, whatever, has a big building. He's living like that, but yet he's speaking against these things but yet he's living them himself. What, 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 what is the epitome of hypocrisy? If you, uh, if you think so, so badly about these things, then don't have it yourself. Are you getting my point? So Brother Yun, uh, uh, when the Chinese police, the Red Army, whatever, <laughs> they found that where the church was, he was having a meeting there. And they, and, they, and they all got scared, like, oh, no, they're here. Maybe they kicked in the door. He went out the back and jumped out the window, but it was on the second or third floor where they were. And when he jumped out the window, when he landed, he, bro he broke both his legs. Both his legs broke. He couldn't walk. He, tr he probably tried to get up and walk, and the bones might have done... Very interesting things, you know. I, I know that because I had one thing happen to me and the, the bones were moving everywhere. Very graphic situation. So I, I know from personal experience. But um, <laughs> the one accident I ever had in my whole life. Anyway, the, so uh, many, many years ago, but it was many, many years ago. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm all right. Uh, but it was it was a brutal situation. It was bad. Oh my God, I suffered something. So uh, he couldn't he couldn't walk. He's laying there moaning in pain, and they came around the back and got him, nabbed him, grabbed him, threw him in the prison, sentenced. Couldn't get back out. Was there for years, and was tortured. Finally, one day, listen. After he was fasting and praying so long, guess what God did? Remember. Remember Paul and Silas when they sang praises? Then the power of God hit the whole jail, and the jailer, the Philippian jailer, was touched, and he got, ended up getting saved after that, you know. And uh, Paul and Silas went out of the prison that, that, very, that very, within 24 hours, they got out. So the day came for Brother Yoon. Somehow the doors opened. Click, click, click. Boom, boom, boom. The doors opened. And the, and the angel of the Lord came and stood next to him and spoke. And said, walk, move, go. And he got scared. He said, I can't. There are guards everywhere. The angel said, look, look. He saw the angel. Look, go. I said, go, do it. So he kept walking. He's shaking. He's thinking, oh, my God, he's going to get shot. He said, if they see him walking and the doors will open, he's out. They're going to just blast him with machine guns. Well, guess what? The Lord blinded all of the, the guards. They never saw him. And the angel said, okay, go to the yard now. Walk outside. Now he's really scared because they got guys pointing guns everywhere, surveillance everywhere, you know? He walked, and the Lord kept telling him, and the Holy Ghost, I guess, was talking, and the angel kept saying, walk. Walk, go, don't stop, don't stop, don't look, go. He walked, 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 nobody saw him. He was made invisible to all of them, and he got out the front gate, and then all of a sudden a taxi cab came like this, and just stopped right there, and the door flew open, and the angel said, go in. <laughs> 
That was an escort from heaven. And he didn't know what was going on. He was shaking like, he's weak from fasting. He used to fast for 72 days. He's, you're almost dead. He had no strength. And he's a skinny guy anyway, you know. And he got in the taxi. He doesn't know what he's doing. I'm sure he's all disoriented. And the taxi, like, knew where to drive to. It was, like, all set up by God. And he got away. And then, guess what? He went straight out of the country. He just found a way. He tells the story in his book. He got out of the country, and he could never go back to China again. He's public enemy number one. And it was said through other people that kind of the word got out, however they found out, if he sets foot here again and we find him, this is the devil's over there, surely they won't even take him to prison. They'll just shoot him and they'll just kill him right there. If they find him, he's dead. And believe me, those kind of people will do it. So the Lord said, your beloved China, you're not going back there uh, for the sake of your life, son. He said, okay, God, now what? The Lord said, travel the world and tell your testimony and raise up the church to get a passion to, to live the gospel. And it, it, it had an effect, you know. It ha it's had a great effect. And uh, I'd like to see where, where he is now, find him again one day. His interpreter is gone, but I'm sure he has another interpreter. I think he went to America... Uh, in fact, or I don't know if he stayed in Europe or where he is. Again, I'm busy. How can I trace everybody down? But if I ever see him again, I would love to see him again. What a great, what a great man of God. These people in China, when they pray, they're serious. You know, they could take one page from the Bible and rip the page and keep it, and they got to fold it and hide it. Because if the government finds you with it, it's illegal. They take the pastors right to jail. And then they come up with this uh, kangaroo court, whatever, sentence them to 20 years hard labor or, or 15 years or 20 years or whatever. Just put them, just convict them and just throw them in jail. They can't get back out for having a Bible. Can you believe it? What a testimony. How many would like God to do that for you? Philip traveled in the spirit. He needed to because I'm sure there was danger there. Jesus walked invisibly through the midst of them. This is the scriptural premise of that. When they were coming to grab him, they couldn't get him. He just disappeared. He, maybe he looked like everybody else, and they looked through everybody, and they couldn't see which one was him. God cloaked him, and he just got through and got away from them. And what did he say about it? It's not yet my time. Wow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, thank you for these supernatural exploits. Raise up people that don't fear their lives. Revelation 12, 11, raise up your life, uh, the lives of people that they don't even fear for their own self. They don't care. They're ready to serve you fully. I'm like that. I'm there. I, I feel uh, more and more like that every day. Thank you, Lord. You're going to use us. You're going to bless us, not abuse us like some men do. But we don't care. You know, I thought of this scripture. I want to get into eliminating the control and eat again, then we'll wrap this in a few minutes. But the, the Lord, uh, uh, what's that scripture? Leap and dance and rejoice when men revile you for my sake, when they abuse you, when they afflict you or attack you or misuse you. Leap and rejoice when you're persecuted. You know what? We call it persecution, but in any way, a mistreatment or a problem, leap and rejoice for great is your reward in heaven. I'll take that reward. That's too good of a deal. Like tithing. Tithing, God said, I'll rebuke the devourer. I'll open the windows of heaven for your sake. I'll rebuke the devourer. I'll, I'll pour you out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive it, number three. And I'll make you a delightsome land for me, says the Lord of hosts. That's four great blessings that the person that pays their tithes, I'm like, I'll take that. All right? We are raising up the, uh, the, the I, I was almost going to say apostolic. Was, this has been prophesied, but I don't like using the title. But this, this, this order is going to go around the world, and people liken me, they call me a nickname Melchizedek, which I thought that's, that's complimentary. That's the high priest, you know? Likened unto Jesus, I'll take that. 
you know, I'm not trying to take someone to myself, but somebody uh, did a prophetic thing and they called me up on the platform and they were doing the demonstration of Abraham and, and they said, uh, Prophet Thomas Manton, you're Melchizedek. That's what the prophet said. So I'm standing there as Melchizedek and they got this other guy, Abraham. It stuck with people everywhere. People going, he's Melchizedek, he's Melchizedek. I told someone in America and they write me messages. Yo, hey, Melchizedek. I'm like, okay. My other friends from New York call me the Lion King, TLK. Hey, TLK, how's it going? The Lion King. I'm like, all right. There's a, there's a great evangelist, a phenomenal evangelist, very powerful man I got from South Africa. He's now gone back to America to work in the big church, and uh, he tried to stay in Africa to do his ministry, but maybe it didn't flow so well as he'd like, and he went back to America. But he calls me, when he, when he writes me a message, he says, Hi, Lion. He just calls me Lion, L-I-O-N. He doesn't call me Thomas, he calls me Lion. I'm like, okay, great. But uh, the order of the tither, it's like, it's a blessing that's too good to pass God up on. You know, because you get all these blessings, all you have to do is do it. And the Lord will begin to bless you. So, people watching, there are many of our partners that are connecting more and more and you're tithing, so let me give you the ways on the screen to do it. They'll be on the screen. Ways to tithe. You can use PayPal. You can use M-Pesa, SendWave. If you need bank wire information, something larger, you can contact me directly by the direct message or WhatsApp, preferably. And uh, ask for the bank details, and I'll be able to send them to you. And you can deposit, direct deposit, wire transfer, even from anywhere in the world to us. And I would very much be happy that you do that because I want to pray for you. And also, thank you immensely from all of me, my mind, my emotions, my heart, my spirit. Thank you, partners, for supporting this work. When you sow into this grace, God is really pleased, and so am I. And I pray for you when I see your name and I see your seed coming or your tithe or your offering or your seed, I I rejoice and I begin to pray for people and people are getting tremendous miracles. There's someone that's in like the, the billions, the billions of real estate in a big uh, fiasco, like very complicated. And they just got two major milestone miracles after we met for coffee. I, I think they took me to lunch. Yeah, they took me to lunch one day and we had a coffee in another place one day. We were supposed to go visit them somewhere and I, I just thought the time was tight and the, the journey was long. So I said, let's just, we're just here. Let's just have a coffee and deal with this right here while we're here. And we did. Uh, and the, the son, they were driving their Range Rover and the, the, the car needed some maintenance. So, uh, and the, the mechanic came right to where we were. He was nearby. So everything got sorted in one place. So God had led us to do everything right there. They're great people, you know, and uh, they begin to connect as partners and the Lord begins to do all these miracles and there are many more coming and I prophesy a succession of miracles of favor of things that couldn't easily be worked out are coming and the treasure at the end of the rainbow that what they call in the old fable the pot of gold at the end of it is there. And you will have that gold. You will have that treasure. You will have the proceeds of all of the properties. In Jesus' name. Many people we're praying for uh, that are in business. And as you're connecting as a partner, tithing some and, and or sowing seeds in, uh, in great dimensions, in large amounts, you will be blessed mightily. And that's, that's, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the prophet, his prophet speaking for him. So the ways to do it are on the screen, to sow seed, to tithe, to give offering, do it now to become a partner of the ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to see everybody, in closing, I want to see everybody get to the point where you eliminate the control of need. You don't need man to help you. You have God helping you. Say amen. You don't, you don't need to be dancing around with people to try to divide up something or they want to jip you or tip you when they should have paid you. Can I give you an instruction? This is what I do. 
Don't touch that money. If they don't give you the right amount, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't put your hand in it. Wrap it up. Put it somewhere. Pray over it and give it all away, 100%. I'm doing it today. Uh, when I can see the place where I want to give it to, I'm doing it. I will not touch it. I'm not going to mix my seed and my holy life and anointing, fire this upon me with someone else's shenanigans of playing games, a jip and a tip. In America, the saying is they jipped you. I mean, G, it used to be G-Y-P, E-D, jipped, meaning you, you, you're a crook. You uh, kept a big part. You, you ripped, you robbed somebody. In other words, you didn't give them what you were supposed to give them. You jipped them. Either you took something out, you stole it, or you didn't give the right. It's called getting gypped. That's a very, that's very old. I don't want to tell my uh, how long I've been on the earth by saying that. That's not a term that the millennials use now. It's not. A, it's not a modern day. That's from way, way back. That's really old school. They got gypped, <laughs> meaning they got uh, taken advantage of. That's okay. And again, the day that it doesn't bother you, you've gotten free from the problem. You've eliminated the control of need. And you say, I feel the same. And I'm telling you, God has, it's God's grace. Because sometimes, you know, in, 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 in older days or elder, what, what would you call it? There's an old English way of saying it. I can't get it right now. In the, uh, in the olden, uh, olden, O-L-D-E-N, yeah. In olden times, you would have got infuriated <laughs> about a situation like that. How can they do that? See, I've been through all that. I've gone through that whole process. And now, as you'd say, as a Kenyan would say, me, I don't care. I don't. None of these things move me. I'm just about the Father's business. You know, when you don't get something from somewhere... Maybe they, didn't, they didn't, obviously they didn't do something right, but that's on them. But for me, we go on, and God makes it up another way. I have to ask you a question, eliminating the control of need. If, if you get what you want, do you, should you care who it came from? No. You care that it comes from somebody good that they'll get blessed. Let me tell you, the person that does good, you can rejoice over them, because they're the one that's going to get blessed by their good action. Well, that's good preaching right there. Oh, yes. Say amen, somebody. Wow, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel I'm getting excited. Say a big amen to that. If you are the one that does something good, you're going to get blessed. So, of course, we want it to be you. So you do that. But if not, let's say if not, for whatever reason. It comes another way. Somebody just comes up and then here comes what you need and you got it. Should you then nitpick and care about who did what? Leave it alone. I have a great apostle friend in America. He's a very, very wealthy man. He is flowing in the kingdom order of uh, finance on levels in the hundreds of millions of dollars go, come and go through his hands. He knows a thing or two about how to flow with money. He's blessed beyond measure. When you have a big work and you're reaching multitudes of people, it equates to a lot of money. If you have massive amounts of people and you're, you're, you're actively having a system in place where proceeds are coming into the thing, it adds up to a lot. You can't, take, you can't leave it as a little because there's so much. There's so much activity. There's so many people. And he has that, like a thousand ministries tithing from around the world under his covering. Then he has a big church. Then he has businesses. Then he has, the man is loaded. Here's what he said. And I, I really had a hard time with this. I think I still did a little bit, but less. Uh, he's doing a conference, and I think a week ago or two, whatever it was, he began to tell the story again. Yeah, a couple of weeks back. I have to find that. I think I took a snapshot of the video. I, I have to watch that again because it's something to let it sink in your spirit. If I could find it, the 15 minutes he was on that topic and just cut that clip out of the video, 
and have it as an archive. I could share it with friends and even watch it again myself and really let it. You know, some words are a bit rough to take, you know. They don't come so naturally to you. You go, oh, that's not right. Here's what he said. And he told his own testimony. And I like that he shared the, the human part of it because we can relate to that. Now the fact that he said that, it kind of makes it all the more easy to swallow. It's more palatable. The taste of it's not so bad. He said when people would rob him, keep the money, send money overseas for a crusade to a city, whatever, and some crooked guy steals it, plays a game, then has an attitude... Uh, his assistant told me a personal story. We were, we were talking on the phone. And it, what a privilege it is to have a, co a private conversation with these men. They're great, great men of God, great generals. And not everybody can get to talk to them, but they love me. So, and he told me the thing about this guy that they were going to a city, got the money. They said, you got to use this guy, this bishop, whatever. And then he got the money, and then he turned around the other way, stole all the money, didn't use it for the thing, stole it, put it in his pocket. And then, even when they were landing the plane in the city, had a bunch of people there to, like, protest them even getting into the country. What a flipping devil. A guy like that. You got to think, is he even going to make heaven? And here's the, here's the apostle, having gone through that, Instead of going, you know that guy, we curse him in Jesus' name. I know how that feels. And you, this guy, he's going to die. He can't do that. He'll, he'll, make, he'll split hell wide open. Ah, he's a thief. He's a liar. He's a crook. He's trying to come against us, but we should come against him and put him down. All this, you know, goes through your mind. And he's just, like he said, years ago, he, when those things happened, he first prayed the prayer, Lord, kill them. <laughs> Let them die. I know how that is. Believe me. Believe you me. Boy, I could tell a lot of stories. Uh, a lot of stories there. And then he goes like this. He goes, you know what? I just counted a seed. It's like I'm sowing it. I thought, what? It was stolen by a wicked person. You, you say, I'll sow it. When I first heard him share this testimony, a principle that he learned a few years ago, I thought, nah, nah, I can't, I can't handle that. That's too advanced. That's too much, you know. And then I listen to it this time. I'm like, you know what? What else are you going to do to be the bigger man? Eliminate the control of need. Say, that came to me. Freely I receive. Freely I give. Hey, the, it's the Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom. I had it. It came. It got misdirected. I just take it like this and I pray. Father, that thing that I had right there, I choose to sow it. I will not hold a grudge or hate a person or want to curse them or anything like that. I just release it. And, it got, and he had so much peace. In fact, he started to look young. He's a, he's, he's, he's a man of age. He started to look in his face. The count, his countenance began to glisten like he was looking younger in a couple of minutes like as he was speaking there. I was like, this is really a God thing right here. Yeah. But you know what it does? When you get to a place like that, you become free from everything. Nothing can affect you. Are you getting it? You got it? It, it can't hurt you. They can't wound you. They can't stop you. They, even the devil, through somebody, could, as the old saying goes, this is also an old school saying, which I don't know if they say it anymore. They call it get your goat. They really got your goat. Or they got on your last nerve. Or they really got gotcha. you. They got gotcha, you, you know. Uh, you, 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 they really snare, snared you. They really got you. They annoyed you. You ever see somebody that wanted you to like take offense when they did something stupid but you didn't? You know the Bible says it's like you're heaping coals of fire on the head. You know that scripture? Love your enemies. Be good to them. Like the Roman soldiers came who were killing the Jews and the ladies would like make them some food, you know? And they, maybe they, a few of them put some poison in it. I'm sure that happened. And the soldiers died. I'm sure that happened along the way. But some would just say, bless your enemy. Just bless them. You know what? You guys are wicked killing our people here. What, what would you like to eat? And then feed them. It says it it deranges them. It's like you're throwing heaps of coal on the, their head. 
These are rough scriptures. And the one that says, pray for those who despitefully use you and curse you and try to hurt you. Pray for them. Bless your enemies. Love your enemies. <sighs> wow. Years ago, the Lord spoke to me. This is a very long time ago. And I'm reminded of it by the Holy Ghost right now. And I haven't thought of this in a while. Wow. The Lord says, son, I want to tell you something. I said, what? It's like the Lord said, guess what? I said, what? I was doing that this morning in the church. Guess what? What? And I tell the people, guess what? I put my hand on my ear. What? The other one. Guess what? They'd say, what? It's like the Lord was saying, guess what? And I say, what? And here's what he said. Son, I want you to love your enemies. Because you have some. I said, I know. Really? Wow. That's the kind of prophecy you don't do backflips and cartwheels about. You don't run around dancing going, hallelujah, God spoke. That's a good one, isn't it? That's, 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 that's intense. That's fierce. Let's lift our hands and pray right now. Yeah, we have the victory. Eliminate every control of need, bondage. It's like water off a duck's back. You know the feathers of the duck have some kind of oil in them that if you pour water, it like beads into a round bead and it just shoo, and the feathers don't get wet. The water doesn't penetrate the feathers. That's a good analogy, like when the devil tries to throw something your way. And you, and you can have a lot of things to say back. A lot of things. You go, and you know what? And another thing. And let me give you a, as a, as a, another old school saying. I'm saying this is like the third or fourth one. Let me give you a piece of my mind. No, you don't want to do that. You need your mind. Keep it. Amen. But let me give you a piece of my mind, like they said, oh, 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 throw in your two cents, they used to call it years ago. Give you my, 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 my uh, vicious opinion about the stupidity you're carrying on with and tell you something, give you some, try to put some sense into it. Amen. And uh, when it doesn't bother you, you're free. And free indeed. And that's the way to live. When you get there, I'm telling you, you've entered the elite class of spiritual warriors. You've gone to a place where the devil can't ensnare you anymore. I was with the man of God yesterday. I met him for the first time. Great old bishop. He's 77 years old. And this guy is something else. I was so impressed. And then I prayed. He began to cry. Oh, Old man, he began to cry, tears. He had to reach, he's reaching in every pocket trying to find his, I don't know what he's looking for. I was hoping he was reaching for a bunch of money to give me an offering because I was probably, I almost thought maybe he's reaching for a bunch of cash. God, prophet, I, I just have to bless you. But you know, around, around here, they don't know about that yet. But I have one guy that did, and he's the son of my archbishop friend. He, he's a police officer. We met him on the street yesterday. He's, the, he's in the GSU, and he shouted at the car. I was driving by, and my friend, my friend has a big black Mercedes. We were driving, and they picked me up. Uh, we went to have uh, lunch somewhere. We wanted, to, we wanted to talk about some business. A very astute businessman, and we were driving. And we passed by the intelligence, the NIS place, and the, the GSU guys were outside. So the windows were open. All of a sudden, the guy goes, Psh! Really loud, like, hey, psh, like this. And I'm thinking, man, I just came from the meeting. I'm uh, like, I'm frazzled. My mind, I'm tired. I'm like, let's go have a coffee. Not that I couldn't do anything, but, but the driver was very alert. He's a very spiritual guy, a great businessman. And he thought, he saw the guy, he turned his head and looked, and he saw that the guy was waving, that he was, he was looking to talk to us. So he stopped the car. I, was going, I'm, I didn't say anything. I thought, why'd you stop? And he's sitting there, and all of a sudden, here comes this guy. <gasps> he's running from far. <sighs> comes up to the window, and he, he leans over. He goes, Prophet Thomas Manton. Wow. I looked at him. I said, hey. He goes, I was in the service when you were preaching and prophesying at Archbishop's. I, I'm, I'm a member of the church. I said, oh, praise God. 
And he grabbed my hand, and he wouldn't let go. And he reached his hand out, he wouldn't let go. He's like, bless me, you gotta bless me, you gotta bless me. I said, hey, he's, I will. I pulled my hand back, I said, just wait a minute. So I started to talk to him, I said, what's your name? And we, we exchanged numbers, let's do that first. And his machine gun, his ugly old gun, you know, the ugly guns they have around, not very fancy ones, they're kind of, they're all chipped up and they were like, he was kind of almost leaning right in at me. So I said, hey, he's got the big smile on his face. And uh, he took out some money out of his pocket and put it in my hand. He said, this is a prophetic seed. I thought, you got that from Archbishop. You got that from that church, that genre. See, they know how to give. People there know how to give. That's a great house. See, we need to all be like that. But I tell you, a lot of people are not like that. Some of these guys, they can have a big church and they're stingy as all get out. They give you nothing and they don't care. It's like they're calloused in their heart and yet they want to see God do things and all that. And they got a lot of money and they just don't want to share it with anyone. That's, that's wrong. Anyway, that's become like a pattern, an evil, nasty, stinginess pattern in the church world in some places. But not everybody's like it. So... When you're in the order of a good house, you're a giver. I remember one time the anointing felt so strong, and as I was walking out, everybody was running up and putting money in my hand, every single one. Prophet, here. They reached my hand, for my hand, here. Stacks of money, putting in my hand, everywhere. And I stick them in my bag. I had a whole stack of cash. I thought, wow, this is a rare church around here, people that would do that. I heard Jesse Duplantis say every time he goes to a mall, people give him thousands of dollars. He said, people just walked to him, are you Jesse Duplantis? Oh, wait a minute. Great to see you, wow. And they reach in, they grab a bunch of hundred dollar bills. He said one day, he, 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 he took out the money that people stuffed in his pockets when he was just walking through the mall, shopping with his wife. Uh, he said it was $14,000 in cash. Someone else might even take a checkbook out and write a check for $20,000. I know another evangelist, it happens like that. People just walk up to him and give him. But deep, you know why? Because these men are givers. They're rich by their giving. You understand? So, eliminating the control of need. You got to work the biblical economic system. You got to become a generous person yourself. Let me give you a scripture. I believe it's uh, Proverbs 11 25. If that's the one that it is, we put it on the screen or whichever scripture it is. It says, The liberal soul shall be made fat. We don't like liberal politically, we don't like it at all. We don't like fat physically, so I don't like the choice of the two words of King James. But I like the, I think it's the New Living Translation, the NLT, I think it is. But we could put the one, I think it's from that. It says, a generous person will become like a well-watered garden. It says, the one who's generous and gives out will also be given to and refreshed himself. Another translation says, and this is the way to get blessed. You want to eliminate the con control of need? You got to work the system. Here men talk about they saw someone struggling and they just gave them money. They weren't in church. One evangelist I know. And Jesse Duplantis does that all the time. He gives to strangers. Like when someone's a waitress and he sees they have a problem, he just takes out a bunch of money, give them, they start crying. They're not in his meeting. They're not a partner of his ministry. It's not offering time in the church. Personally, hundreds of dollars, hundred dollar bills. One said, uh, uh, I, the Lord spoke to him to help people that uh, have kids that need to come out of the public school and go to the private Christian school, that he should find 10 people like that and pay for it. Next thing you know, it's like the same night, the, the very same day in the evening, or, or the very next day, really soon, he, he sees a guy, he's a waiter, he says, talking about his daughter, he says, uh, he sees the man of God with his daughter, he goes, oh, I have a daughter about your age, and then the man of God asks him, yeah, oh, oh yeah, and she's having a problem in school, and we need to take her out and put her in Christian school, and the guy goes, the wheels start turning, he goes, and keep talking, because <laughs> the Lord had already spoken to him, to find 10 people, so the guy says to him, he says, you know what? How much is the tuition for your daughter to go to the Christian school? The guy already had the, the statistics of all the fees. He knew about it because he, he looked into it. He says, this much, so many thousands of dollars. And the man of God says, I'm going to pay for that. The guy says, what? He gets shocked. He gets quiet. No. What? Why would you do that? He says, I know why. 
I'm just going to do it. How much is it? And how do we arrange to send it to you? And he's, he's been doing things like this for years. When you live like that, even when you don't, when you start, start from way back when you didn't even have a lot, you start living like that to be generous to humanity, especially to anointed ministry, like a, being a covenant, a covenant partner of the ministry here. Great. But also when you see a need somewhere, you just begin to fill it. You're just, a, there's another angel right there. And this is the big one. I believe this is the one that carries the glory for financial breakthrough because I saw a, a bigger flash of gold light. That means there's gold in the thing. Let's lift our hands right now. The Holy Ghost, the angel of the Lord standing right here. Sometimes I see a flash of white light. It's white light. I see it. I saw it there. And then I saw it another over there. This one was like a gold orb, like a gold, like the size of, a, I don't know, Round, big like that, and it went, and then disappeared. This is a different kind of angel. Then I'm talking about this right now. Now, Father, send, you send your ministering spirits to us to minister to us who are heirs of salvation. I pray for everyone. That everyone begin to experience financial breakthrough in ways they've never seen in their life, supernaturally, and that we all become givers. I heard my archbishop friend say, uh, my beloved Archbishop, he said, he said, never let anybody be taking the offering that's not a giver of themselves because they'll kill the giving spirit. I thought, hey, talk. He, didn't, he may not say this in a, in a service, but he said, he said this is at a pastor's leaders meeting. He said, begin to share some principles. He talked about how God challenged him about when he began to pray about church growth. He said he had about 500 people. He wanted to go to 1,000 people, members of the church. The Lord says, you're not ready for that. He said, what do you mean I'm not ready? I'm trying to reach out to everybody. I've given my life. I am ready. What do you mean? He began to argue with God. He said, no, God, you, God said, you have to deal with this issue and this anger issue. Something He told it. I'm telling you what he said publicly. I would never repeat it uh, if it was in confidence and said privately. I would never share it. But he said it over the microphone to like hundreds of leaders in the room. I grabbed a hold of it. I thought, yeah. God has to do things. And he prophesied to me, another angel right here. Wow, you saw this one was like it has a, it like a, looked like a halo, like a round white. It was white. This one's got the gold. This one's got the white. It looked like a, like a halo kind of crown, white. Jesus, amazing. Father, let them all work for us. We don't want them to be here. You're angels and we don't say anything about it. Wow. And he prophesied to me, the Archbishop prophesied over me, he said, God's giving you, giving, giving you a new heart. I know he's saying that from his own testimony. And he said, God's going to send you to all the great men of the world. And then another prophecy the same week, uh, maybe it was even the next day in the conference we were speaking together. We had a, a minute before he was leaving. After he preached, I preached first, and then he preached, and I was invited. We were at this other other great apostle friend's church. I was on the program. Archbishop was on the program. He was closing it out. I spoke before, in, in the two days, a Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon, and Archbishop closed out the two nights. Now the second night, he said, "God's going to give you." Uh, uh, connections with an international network of leaders and they're going to be uh, show you favor and be a blessing to you and gather with you and for you just because they love you. He called my name. Thomas Manton, he said, because they love Thomas Manton. I thought, wow. Now, I also have to say another one that he said at another church sometime before that in the, in the, in the branch, the biggest branch of a certain region Again, I was speaking first. He was coming in to speak, and he invited me himself. Now, you know, the junior bishop is going to say, oh, come on, Thomas Martin, you're in. Here's the microphone. You have time, because the archbishop said so. He invited me to come there. Of course, I'm going to be on the program. So I'm speaking, and archbishop comes out, and he says, uh, Prophet Martin must have spoke very well here, because the people are very happy and then everybody went, yeah, they all started cheering. I was like, wow. Now, when, when the last night of the meeting, we did three nights, 
as he was leaving, the Holy Ghost blew like a wind like this. And he said, I see the favor of God coming. And he mentioned two people. He didn't say their names. He said two people in particular. And, I, and I've come to find out who those people are. And he said, the favor of God's going to come and you're going to build your world headquarters, your international headquarters. That's what he said. And he, when he said it, he, he, it's like the, the wind of the spirit like blew him back and his face, his countenance changed, his eyes lit up. And he was like, wow. He's like amazed at what just, the word that just came out of him. You know, and a man that has apostolic authority as a general, when he prophesies, it's not just the information, but it has weight under the mantle and the anointing to put it into motion, you see. So I'm sharing some very interesting, uh, uh, deep intel here in this message in a, lot of, in a lot of arenas and realms. And I trust and believe you are very blessed by this. Get free, get delivered, Test everything, see everything, manifest. God will help you. He won't let you be in the wrong situations. And you will know the divine connections, the right one from the wrong one. And the difference be also between the good and the right, the good and the perfect, as I could say, according to Romans 12, 1, 2, and 3. And you will eliminate the control of need from your life. Again, thank you for being a partner. We're going to put the information up on the screen one more time right now for you to sow into this anointing and this grace and this work of God that's going around the entire world. The Lord bless you. Thank you for being my partner. I'm starting to see more traffic because we've done so many messages online, YouTube, Facebook, and all the channels. And I'm starting to see like names I didn't know before will just send a seed. It's coming. It's breaking loose, and it hasn't really kicked into that. We want to see the river come where it goes into the millions, okay? And that will happen. So you be a part of that. Break the ice for yourself. Break the realms open for yourself of you being blessed. When I see your name coming and you're sowing seed, I consider you a partner and a member of the tribe, a member of the family, a member of the Dominion tribe, the Dominion family, as we affectionately call it. Uh, you're part of the family, and I'm going to pray for you, and you're going to see some blessings happening in your world. Get ready to be blessed. In Jesus' name, knowing the true divine connections, you won't always have to wait, as I said in the beginning, for God to speak uh, specifically. He may devise a way to actually get it to the point where you'll see how it is with the person, and then you know if you're going to walk together or not, you see. And then this thing about you get to the point where I don't need any man to help me per se, although men are used to help, but God orchestrates things. And even in the midst of all kinds of craziness, and then you still have expenses to pay and you don't know. And you just have peace because you know God is supernaturally going to work it out. I did a whole series. Wow, the angels of the Lord are here. There's another one. Closer this time, closer to me right here, right above me, right here on the right side. I did a series called The Money is Coming. We're writing a book on that. I'm writing a book on that from the transcripts of the messages. And uh, the money is coming. This is a prophecy for you, prophecy for myself, prophecy for the world in the body of Christ everywhere. The money is coming. The Lord said so. The money that's needed, it's really there. It's really being sanctioned by the angels, by the power of God himself, his own power, and it's coming into our hands. We're coming to it, and it is coming to us, and God is raising up the best of the best people. In fact, if you lose someone along the way and it doesn't seem like you thought they were great, it seems they weren't so great. I believe that the devil that attacked the situation maybe or something was wrong, uh, uh, we need to be compensated for that. When the thief steals, you get paid back seven times. So let's say the next person coming along now is even better in a lot of ways than the other one. You got to watch who occupies your space. I'm trying to get out of here. I'm trying to close this, but you see? 
This is very, very uh, relevant to the whole message. You have to watch who's occupying your space because not everybody can occupy the space. Right? Opportunity cost, and I'm definitely closing on this. Opportunity cost is you're getting a result or a sum total by the way you're doing something now at this level or this level or wherever you are. And then you could have been doing it this way on a higher level, maybe with a higher level person, better situation, whatever. And now you put this under this. The opportunity cost in economics is the sum in between the two. You're getting this down here, but you could have had this up here. What you lost in between the two is the opportunity cost. The very powerful economic principle. So we need to see that gap filled. Can you say amen? I am very gifted. I'm a very gifted man. You see how the Holy Ghost is speaking. Did I hardly slept last night? I jumped up at 5 in the morning. I left the house before dark, when it was dark outside. I don't do that every day, but I, I probably, I, I'll, maybe I'll have to more often. And was in the pulpit in the big... Uh, conference at 7, and then they had me there in all these services the rest of the day, up until after 2 o'clock, my Lord, maybe it was going to 3 o'clock, and then we came all the way back over here to the studio, and now someone was trying to see me, I hope they haven't sent me a uh, Roger message, now it's gotten to 7 p.m., so how many hours is that, 14 hours straight? rolling, that's my kind of day. And I'm happy and I feel great because I'm serving the Lord. Father, bless my friends in Jesus' name, every business represented, every inheritance, every business idea, every ministry that's connected. You need to be a generous giver into this anointing. And watch God begin to just overshadow your life with new power and lavishly bless you. And I believe that will happen, and that is the word of the Lord. I'm Thomas Mantham IV. We'll talk to you on the next broadcast. God bless you. Uh, the announcer's coming on to share some things about what partnership does with the ministry, and listen, listen at that. We're going to be doing a lot more creative television programming, and I'm very excited about it. Anyway, see you on the next broadcast. I also want to do li start to do live uh, at a certain time every day. We'll announce when it is. I'm not going to let the cat out the bag. Meow, meow, the cat's in the bag. I'm not going to let him out to live. I'm just, we're, we're just going to do it. I'm not going to announce it. We just, it's just going to happen. So I'm planning that, and uh, we want to see more people following us online around the planet. It seems good when you have a specific time. Other people said that to me before. I don't think I scoffed at it, but I just wasn't ready to do it. My schedule is too much, too much, and I'm a bit spontaneous, and I couldn't just say, well, I'm going to schedule it this time. But guess what? I found some technology, technological way, technology to help me that we can have schedules, so I'm excited about it. Get ready to see that. The Lord bless you. Keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace, his power, and also his prosperity. You need to also get the, my book, Prophetic Keys to Successful Living. And uh, you could just text the word book to the number that's on the screen now as we're going off the air here in a few seconds. And you can get a copy of this book. We'll tell you how. Uh, you could write me for prayer to the same number. Send a WhatsApp or a text message asking for prayer. Let me see you uh, requesting this, and I, I'll, I'll be happy to communicate with you and see you, and also welcome you in, welcoming you in. I will welcome you in as part of the Dominion family, the Thomas Manton family. I love you so much for connecting. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next one. Well, Lord, is that it? I feel like there's always something else I want. He wants to say. Anyway, I'll wrap it there. We'll pick it up on the next broadcast. Love you much. And by the way, everything we talk about and share 
is done to instruct the body of Christ on how to get blessed. And officially, I want to say, we love everybody. Do you get that? I, Thomas Manton IV, love everybody, no matter what is what or who, how they are, how anybody is. We have love for everybody. Jesus gave the command, love one another. We do it. Everything's spoken in love, but also by admonition and instruction, encouragement, and some expose on, you know, things to look for that you can avoid pitfalls and traps and live a very successful life in Jesus' name. And these are some of the ways to do it. We'll, we'll get into this and, uh, and many other things further in another message. The Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, give you his peace, his power, and prosperity. I'm Thomas Matthew the Ford. Love you much. God bless you. Bye-bye for now. Dear brethren, in Psalms 119-105, the Bible says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Truly, God has sent prophet Dr. Thomas Manton IV to proclaim and declare his word of abundance and prosperity prophetically unto the nations. Thus, brothers and sisters in Christ, I urge you, just as the Bible says in Matthew 10, 41, whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet reward. Let us welcome and embrace the prophet of God by supporting his ministry. You can sow a seed, you can send your love offering, you can support or partner in the ministry program using the details displayed on your screen. For when the prophet of God decrees a blessing upon you, indeed, you shall be blessed.